Tonight we're talking about the title is, um, it, it, we called it uh, Staying Engaged. And we don't mean engagement in the sense of premarital engagement. We're talking about this oneness that we, we brought up. Is anyone here just engaged, not married yet? Do we have any oh. couples that are, okay. Yeah. Right there, look at that. Engaged, engaged over here. Nice. Oh, nice. that's exciting. Yeah, that's cool. There, there is a little caveat to tonight. This is actually a, a much longer, it's kind of a two-part teaching, and part two will be on Sunday. So here's a plug to come to church on Sunday. We're going to be unpacking the other half of this and revisiting some of the material, but it'll be, like I said, the other half. But um, the idea we're talking about here of staying engaged is this idea that we come together as, um, as a couple in, in a place of marriage, and we come together, remember we said body, soul, and spirit. That's, we called that last week oneness. And, uh, and, and, and what God had said, join together, you know, remember that it's a marriage vow. What God has joined together, let no man separate. They used to say that all the time. I don't know if they say it anymore. But, but that's kind of the goal. That's what we're after. How do we stay engaged with one another? I think it is, it's interesting, too, because of the play on words. Because when, when a couple says we're engaged, you, you realize, oh, okay, they, they're serious now. This isn't just dating. They haven't just come together, come apart, come together. No, they've decided, no, we are engaged in something. We're engaged in something that we expect to last our lifetimes. And, uh, and that, that is kind of what we want to talk about. Like, how do you stay engaged in the process of being married for your entire life? If you've ever met a couple that just feels like, or maybe you have been that couple that feel checked out in the process of being married, like the, the contract is still there, you're, you're still in the same house, you're under the same roof, but are you engaged? Yeah. And so we talked last week about oneness and the idea of oneness, if you remember. They were, they were one before the fall, before sin and all the mess started. They were one with God. They were, they, they had, they were engaged. They, were, they, were, they had fellowship with God on a regular basis. They were one with each other. It says they became one flesh. That's in Genesis. And they were also one in the sense of they were whole as individuals. That's really important. They weren't fragmented. And, and after the fall, everything cracked. That, that word we used, I think we threw it out last week, or maybe it was Sunday, icon. It, it's, this, it's this word to describe this oneness. And when sin happened, that thing cracked. And they became disengaged with God, with one another, and even with themselves. Yeah, so look at uh, this Colossians 19 and 20 verse here. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Because in that, there was a oneness, but then there was a brokenness. And it wasn't just my relationship with God that was broken. It wasn't just like, oh, well, I've lost that relationship with God, but that's all right. Me and the missus are still great. Or me and myself, I, I, I still have this, you know, figured out. Or me and creation, all of God's creation. Now, all four of those things that were supposed to be whole, each one of them was cracked. But there is this that we see, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that is Christ, and through him to reconcile, not just us to God, but us to, to one another. And you see that throughout Scripture, the reconciliation of, of man and woman, of nations, of, of peoples, reconciliation of man uh, with himself. Yeah. So I want to show you a movie clip. It's a silly little clip. It's actually a cartoon, so bear with me. But when I saw this movie, it came out years ago, there was a scene that absolutely stopped me in my tracks. As I watched it unfold, I almost cried. I don't know, it was meant to be funny, meant to be silly, but there is such truth in this particular clip that I use it, we use it a lot when we do this kind of a series. Now, the movie is called The Incredibles. And, you all uh, cried at The Incredibles, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but in the beginning of the movie, there is Bob and his wife and his family, and um, they have an encounter. It starts in the driveway, at, like most encounters, and ends up in the kitchen, right? And so we just want to show you this clip. Just kind of watch. Listen carefully to what Bob and his wife say, sometimes to each other, but sometimes they're just kind of 
throwing it out there. They're just kind of lobbing it into the air. Listen to the, 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 the statements or the questions that are asked or made here in this clip. You guys just want to finish the movie now, yeah, don't you? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Come back, come back. Yeah. When I watched that, uh, we'll go back to that in just a bit here, but um, I just saw and listened to so many things in that interaction, that brief interaction. This man, this strong and dedicated family man, what is he doing in the kitchen? What, what was he doing in the kitchen? He was, he was reading the paper, but what was he doing? Yeah. He was, he was dreaming, right? And what was he dreaming about? I want to be a superhero. I want to have superpowers. And of course, that dream is brought back to reality when he hears those words, Bob, it's time to engage. Because what's happening? Well, the mom, who loves those kids, is trying to keep them from killing each other. And so I need she, you. She says, I need you. I need you, Bob. Kids, listen to your mother. Okay. Right? So, you know, in, in, the, in the fall, um, Paul addresses this in marriage in Ephesians chapter 5. And, and here's what he says, uh, not just in marriage, but um, I'm sorry, I can't see if I got this up here then. Yeah, he said, be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, he said, do not be foolish. Understand what the Lord's will is. And so Paul's given these super practical instructions about how to live in that present age. In that present age, I'm sure there were differences, but I think there were a lot of similarities going on. There was paganism, and there was adultery, and there was fleshliness, and there was all kinds of debauchery. And he said, listen, don't be foolish. Understand what the Lord's will is. Don't be out getting drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. He said, but fill, be, instead be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he, he throws in this verse that we started with last week is submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Isn't that interesting? There's a, there's a connection here between... Um the hymns and songs and the spirit and, and debauchery. Like our heart wants to move towards something. And I know debauchery is kind of an old-fashioned word. It's, it's uh, just indulging the flesh, just indulging the, the nerve endings. We just, we, we move towards that. I, that. We move towards comfort. Are, are, are you not? I mean, if, if you've never had an addiction in your life, aren't you kind of addicted to comfort if nothing else? Just that, I just want to be comfort. I just want things to be easy, that, that feeling. And there's this call up to something else, like pay attention to how you're living. The, the, this, this road leads somewhere. The days are evil. Instead, move towards psalms and hymns and spiritual. Go, go with the Spirit is what he's saying here. So we use a word in the Christian world a lot, and it's in the Bible. It's temptation, right? Temptation. Eve was tempted. Adam was tempted, you know, um, and so on. But I want to use another word called allure, Allure is kind of like temptation, but it almost has like a, it has like a, a hypnotic, magical effect. You say, oh, that, that's so alluring. It's like, oh, I can't stop looking at that. I can't stop thinking about that. I can't stop fantasizing about that. Now, in, in, in the book of Timothy, Paul says to his protege, he said, Timothy, he said, you need to hold on to faith. You need to hold on to faith. Another version might say it, hold fast to faith and a good conscience. Let that sink in. He says to Timothy, now who is Timothy? Timothy is his young protege. Timothy is the up-and-coming pastor, the man with a, of God, with a call of God on his life and a dream. And Paul's advice, Paul as a senior, as an elder, says, Timothy, hold on to your faith and hold on to a clear conscience. Because some people have rejected that and they have suffered, suffered the shipwreck in regard to their faith. We would call in common language, they have crashed and burned. They have shipwrecked their faith. And Paul knew what he was talking about. And this is the church. This is the early church. This is Paul speaking to his protege, Timothy. So excuse us for being super obvious, but a healthy marriage takes healthy people. 
And, and healthy people, they have to pay attention to themselves. I, I, I've got to pay a certain amount of attention to myself. So as we talk about marriage and, and caring for the other and laying down our rights and taking care of the other person, that will only happen if I've also paid attention to my own soul. What's going on with my soul? Because then the temptation is, rather than deal with God because God is scary to deal with, I'd rather deal with my spouse. And maybe I want to deal with you almost as if you're God. You be healthy for me. You be spiritually healthy. You, you be the one, and I'll just kind of live in the draft of your, I'll just live in the wake of your relationship with God. But that, that never actually works. Or maybe I want to just respond to you like, let's, let's both just ignore this, this God thing, and let's just try to have good relationship with one another. But that doesn't work outside of God, because we were made to do this in God relationship. That's why we say that oftentimes when a couple are in trouble, they do have a marriage problem. I mean, they're arguing, fighting, or whatever. They're angry, they're frustrated, but uh, they really have a God problem. They really have a, an issue with God. And like we, you know, we've said it earlier, I think, in the, in the series, that oftentimes you know, in a conflict, there isn't my perspective. Here's what I think happened, and here's what I feel, and da-da-da. And there's what you think happened, and how you feel. But then there's a third party, and that's, well, what does God say actually happened? And what does he think we should do? And I'm telling you right there, and what I just said is really the key to navigating conflict where it does make you better instead of bitter, like we said last week. Conflict then becomes a price that you end up going deeper. It may not all be fun, but you see, because God has this idea of marriage. So listen, if, if, like we read last week in Ephesians 5, if, if marriage is God's object lesson to a broken, divided world, we would, you'd think you would ask the question, well then, which way are the bullets coming from? You know what I'm saying? Which, which, which way is the, is the temptation coming from? Because we don't live in a neutral universe. And the enemy of our souls, the enemy of God, is not interested at all of us, in us having a healthy marriage, something that proclaims the grace and mercy of God. So what is the battle against me and you and us really, really going to look like? The funny thing is this is an ancient battle. I know we just used a, a clip from a modern cartoon. Uh, but let's try to sound smart for a minute and talk about Greek mythology. Uh, in Greek mythology, there are, uh, there are these sirens, and they show up in different parts of Greek mythology in the story, and one of the stories is about this, uh, this man and, uh, and his shipmates. His name is Odysseus. And, uh, and a siren in Greek mythology was a mythical creature with a, uh, the upper half of a woman and the bottom half was a bird. I know, beautiful, right? Uh, and, and the thing about sirens is they, they sang a song that was irresistible. And it, it, it drew you in. But when they drew you in, your ship was dashed upon the rocks and you were, you were lost. And it lulled you, though, into complacency. Even though you knew intellectually this is a mistake, there was still some allure to it that pulled you towards it and towards your doom. But first you had to kind of almost fall into a sleep. But Odysseus it was on this, this, this journey, and he really wanted to hear what that song sounded like because nobody had ever heard it and lived because if you heard it, you died. You moved towards it, and you died. But he came up with a brilliant plan. He goes, here's what we're going to do on our ship as we go past the sirens. I want all the men in my ship to plug their ears with wax and then tie me to the mast of the ship, and I alone won't have my ears plugged with wax, so you won't hear what they're singing, and you will move us the direction we're supposed to go, and I will hear it. But now you cannot untie me no matter what it looks like is happening to me. Leave me tied to that mast no matter what. And in that, he heard the siren song, and he screamed and yelled to be let go, but they, they traveled through. And he screamed and yelled to be let go. So he was in the pull of the alluring siren song. And he throws caution to the wind. Fortunately, his men obeyed him, and they, they didn't untime. They got through. But you hear what is behind this allure is this trap of death. Now, Paul, again, speaks to this throughout the, throughout the whole... Um, he, listen to what he says here, and I think it's in Peter. He said, listen, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires because they wage war against your soul. Listen, temptation and allure never comes at us in an ugly form. It wouldn't be alluring. I'm not, a, I'm not tempted by something that's awful. 
know what I'm saying? I'm tempted by a nice piece of cheesecake, right? I'm tempted by something that says to my, my five senses, you're going to enjoy this. You know, you don't go fish for salmon with bottle caps on the end of the hook. You put some kind of smaller fish that's very tasty, very attractive. And so Paul says, he listen, or Peter said, listen, be careful. Listen to what Paul says to his protege, Timothy. Again, he said, Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for all the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, to teaching. Now listen, to, hear, hear the imperatives here. Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, don't just drift. Don't just kind of float. The, the Christian life is not like a river float where you're on an inner tube and like, well, I don't know how long it'll take to get there. I'm just, I'm just in the water. Paul's saying, Timothy, you can't do that. He said, don't neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands. Timothy, be diligent in these matters. Tim Timothy, give yourself wholly to them so everyone may see your progress. Timothy, watch your life. Timothy, watch your doctrine. Timothy, persevere. Because if you do... You'll save yourself, and you're also going to save others, right? You'll save those that listen to you. Do you hear the imperatives there? Timothy, Timothy, come on. Timothy, don't fall asleep at the wheel. Timothy, don't be passive. Timothy, get a hold of this. Hold on to this. Hold fast to this. In a sense, we all go through like this Odysseus story. There's kind of two sides to it. On the one hand, I, I need people around me who even when I'm being stupid and, and want to go towards my destruction will hold me back. I need that. That's why community is so important. But also, if the only thing that's holding me back is others, then I'm probably already lost. I will slip through their fingers eventually and run towards my destruction. And so Paul is telling Timothy here, you've got to pay attention to yourself. I, I your father, won't always be here. And, and I, I, I think about that when raising kids. Mm -hmm. I won't always be here. What I'm trying to do is not just be the government for you, be the control. I can't be the fence all the time. Eventually, you have to decide. You have to be able to tell yourself no. That's something, it's a conversation I had with my kids a lot when they were little. Dad's telling you no right now, but I'm, I need you to grow up to a place where you have the ability to tell yourself no. Do you have the ability to tell yourself no? Wouldn't it be great again if when we were weak, the enemy of our soul said, you know, I'm going to wait till you get better and then we'll talk. No, that's not how it works at all. That is not how it works. That is not how it works. And so we said, remember last week, that I have a relationship with God. I need a relationship. But also the woman I'm married to, she has to have a relationship. But then we, it, the marriage has to have a quality of life. So those three things are really important. My quality of life your quality of life, and then it, the quality of life of our marriage. Now, we all know that we go through seasons, right? Seasons of, of unexpected things, seasons of fatigue, seasons of having children, seasons of retirement, all kinds of things, and those all play into it. Seasons of sickness, right? Seasons of financial challenge. Those things pick away. They play at us. But again, Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, hold on. Hold on fast. So last week we read this passage. I'm going I'm to just start. I'm going to ju jump ahead a little bit. I want to read it in Ephesians again. Uh, let's see if I can find this here. Um, yeah. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Gave himself up for her. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of the water through the word. To present her to, to, her, to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or blemish. So here's this homework. Here's this homework of the man, right? In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife cares for himself. See, he's, he's, he's making deliberate distinctions about what we're supposed to be doing, what, what playing offense looks like. After all, no one ever hated their body, but they feed and care for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of this body. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect or come underneath the leadership of this husband. You notice, see the context here of what they're doing to and for each other? You're not alone in this. You got married because you invited someone else into your life. 
And now it's the two of you, and now there's an assignment that each one of you have. And if you are ignorant of that assignment, or you are like, I don't want that assignment, you know what that's called? That's called conflict. That's called conflict. You ever heard the term unequally yoked? It's in the, it's in the New Testament. Paul says, don't be unequally yoked with somebody. In other words, don't give your life and body and soul to somebody who's not on the same page with you. Now, it doesn't mean that you think exactly like we both love Mexican food. We both, you know. But that's not what he's talking about. It's talking about this. Do you guys, have you guys entered into this New Testament yoke of marriage? That's something in engagement is really worth talking about. That's the main thing we look for in premarital coaching. Are you guys in this? Are you really going together? Because a believer has a destiny. That destiny is heaven. That destiny is eternal life. A non-believer has a destiny. And that destiny is not eternal life. So on earth, am I going together? Are we really going together? The context, like Bruce just said, incredibly important here. The context that this verse is describing is marriage. So in the context of marriage, love and respect, both these things have to exist. But the design, what that, what that is supposed to look like, the design that you see here is as Christ loved the church. That's what it's supposed to look like, as Christ loved the church. So we don't get to decide our own design, but we have to submit to the design that we see in Scripture, which what we, we find here is, okay, well, what Christ's headship, leadership looks like is dying for someone else, giving his life for somebody else. Have you ever been in a conflict with your spouse that it just kind of, it, it seemed to like snowball? Like it maybe started small, but then certain things were said, attitudes, door slam, silence, no touch. And something that started small actually got bigger and went on for days and days. Is it just me or did anybody else experience that kind of a thing, right? We want to just, as we kind of draw the teaching piece to a close, I want to unpack that idea. Remember, so what we've said is God has an assignment for us. God is for us. There's an enemy who's against us. My marriage, our marriage represents the kingdom of God in a dark world, the lost world. The thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. So there's a, there's a slide I want to put up, and it, it's kind of an interesting, uh, it's like a diagram, I guess, if I can get it to go here. Come on. Um, I don't know if, can you read all the words on the right and the left? Can you read the words? Um, so in this, in this diagram, it, it kind of represents a triangle, the, the way the slide is formatted. Not, you might not see it, but there's the man on the left, and there's the woman on the right, and they relate to each other there on the bottom in this thing called marriage. They have stood before a pastor and they said all the right words and they exchanged the rings and they kissed and they cried and they took pictures and they literally went out of that room, I believe, as one flesh. Now, are they complete? Of course not. I mean, who, no one gets, you know, you don't get it. There, no one has like a, oh, I have a bachelor's degree in marriage. Well, I have a master's degree. No one has that. We're all in process. We're, none of us are experts. But something happened on that wedding day. But the wedding day segues into the marriage. And so in this diagram, we have these sort of, um, the word, we use the word roles on the left and the right. Now, we're going to read them and just talk briefly about each one. But think about the clip as we read those. What is God, we just read, called man to do? Well, he's a Christ figure. The first thing up there is he's a Christ figure. Doesn't mean, guys, that you're Jesus to the family. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Yeah. It means, but what, where do we get that? Theologically, where do we get that? It just said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And he said, prepare her by the washing of, you know. So there's this, there's this sense about, God's saying to the man, listen, you have a job that's very similar to what Jesus is doing with his church. You want to protect this woman. You want to, you want to take her. And, and the woman, on the other hand, on the, on the other side, is this companion. It's not a, a value judgment. You've come into this together, but just with different functions and different tasks, different emphasis. Mm -hmm. On the woman's side is life giver. Uh, and, uh, man, there's a lot of life around Church on the Hill right now. There are a lot of babies. But this isn't just about the ability to carry a baby, which is an amazing miracle. I talk to these dads, and they're just like, their mind is blown. Alfonso, the Kaiser campus pastor, he's just like, she just made a baby. Like, just, 
I watched it. It just came out. It was amazing. It came out of her. There it was. You know, like we, we, don't, we don't get that. We don't have that. That's, that's not us. But it's more than just biological. There's, there's an ability that my wife has to create life in me. She can give me life. I watch her give things life. And it, it's remarkable. Often it is, is with words, but sometimes it's with actions. It, it happens in a lot of different ways. And it, it, and it blows my mind every time she does it. And like an encourager, to encourage, to breathe courage into someone. When I'm down and depressed and think I'm a failure and don't know what I'm supposed to do, she just comes in and just starts speaking life to me. And suddenly I start to believe it. It starts to happen inside of me. I, I, I become what she's speaking into existence. You, ladies, you do this because you're such good nurturers. You do this with your sons and your daughters. Mm -hmm. You speak life to your kids. Because that next one there, under the women, you're, you're amazing with words. And guys, most guys, we're just not. We're not. Have you seen that statistic? Women are like, you're at 30,000 a day, and guys get about 600, and we're like, we're done. I don't need to, I don't need to talk anymore. It's funny, guys can go, guys, I know this is hard to imagine, guys can go to movies, like seven guys go to a movie, and they just all sit in a row, and they all watch the movie and eat their own popcorn, and when it's over, they go home. My wife asks me this all the yeah. time when I'm with what, friends. She's what, like, what did you guys talk yeah, about? Yeah, did you ask him about uh -huh. his daughter? No, well, like, they just had a baby. What, how, how's it going? Like, yeah, I, don't know. I didn't know they had a baby. Yeah. Well, didn't you ask him? Why would I yeah. ask him that? I just assumed you'd ask them. Well, it didn't come up. Like you didn't ask, you were there for four hours, you didn't ask how he was doing? Who talks about that? I just figured if he was doing bad, he'd tell me. Yeah, yeah. If he wanted to offer the information. But the other thing, isn't it interesting, even the posture? Even the posture of six or seven guys, and, and they, just are, they just look forward the whole time. They just watch. And every once in a while, did you see that? Yeah, I seen that. Oh, did you see this? Yeah. But they don't ever look each other in the eye. I can just watch women at a coffee shop oh my and gosh. get uncomfortable because they'll just, oh. hey. Oh. I can't even do it. I can't oh. pretend to do it. And they're, yeah, yeah. no, look me in the no, eye. No, I don't want to no, do no, it. No, no, look me in the no. eye. No, really. And, and ladies, you're just you're like, like, you're like, weeping. You're reach you're across weeping. the table. Yeah. But what are you doing? You're exchanging life. I know it, it is funny, but it's also real. Like something real is happening there. The guys speak a different language. Like we, if we are face to face, eye to eye, we're about to be in a fight usually. No joke. If you watch, you guys know this. You, if I stare at you long enough, we're mad at one another. You looking at we're me? having a staring contest to see who's going to look away first, who's the alpha here. If you're wondering. But now think about, think about how you can miss each other. Mm -hmm. Because looking someone in the eye is very important to you. But to some people, the other sex, the opposite sex, not so much, maybe. And it's not because they don't love you. It's not because they don't care. It's just because they're different. Um, Emerson Egerich, Love and Respect book, he asked this great question all the time. He said, it's not wrong. It's just different. Is that okay? It's not wrong. It's just different. Can I jump to the guy's side for a second? What does he, what does he call these men to do? He's called us out of Ephesians to lead. He's called us to lead. Now, I believe in plurality of leadership. My wife has great things that she brings to the table. My wife is right about a lot of stuff that I've been wrong about. So I, I lean into that. I need that. My wife is intuitive. Guys are logical, right? Yeah, guys, did your wife ever say, you know, I just got a feeling about this. You need to listen when she says that. It drives me nuts. <laughs> I hate it when she comes to the right conclusion without any logical steps It's illogical. In it How did you get nuts. there? It makes me so mad. I can come to the wrong conclusion logically, and she comes to the right one illogically, and, I'm, and I don't want to accept it because she got there illogically. But that's just, but look, I, I, know, I know it's okay. We're going to laugh at this. It, you know, it's real. But, again, it's not just a joke that we're called to lead and we won't ask for directions. It, it, honestly, if that's you as a guy, what are you doing? What are you, you call lead and you won't ask for help? You won't, I mean, that's nuts. To be lost and not ask for direction. I'm not just talking about literally being lost now and trying to get to a, a city. But I'm talking about you're lost and you don't have, you just lead, you just charge forward anyway and you don't, the one that God gave you to be a help isn't consulted in the, de in the decision. That's not, that's not leadership. That's not as Christ loved the church. Listen to the one under leader, God, honor. Again, men, 
I don't understand it all. I just know it's real, and I know it's true. Men rise up and are drawn towards the concept of honor. They, something deep in the heart of a man resonates with the fact that honor and respect, honor, I'm using honor and respect almost interchangeably here. Look this at the is, movies that guys will watch. Yeah. Well, yeah. You show me an, a movie where, where guys are being honored. I like one Christmas movie. There's only one, and it's White Christmas. And it's a musical. I don't even like musicals. But it's all about this man who served in the military and these men coming around and honoring him at the end and do, just honoring him. It gets me every time at the end of that movie, right? When, when they say something to the effect of, you know, like, what, what you've done for us, we recognize, they, they, they just stand and salute. And I'm like, it wrecks me every time. That means nothing to my wife. She's like, I like the pretty songs. Remember, the, Give you, me a love story. You guys play sports, and you guys played sports, and you had like the, coach, like the coach from hell. The guy was abrasive. He would scream at you. He, I mean, back when I was in school, they, they could, the gloves were oh, off yeah. back then. You they dirty could, maggot. You, you call little... you names. Mm -hmm. Just shame you. You know, Monday through Thursday. And then on Friday, you get together for the game. He's like, I believe in you guys. And the men would be like, we'll we're going to win. You. Right? They would die for the guy. Just like in the military, men, you know, they, you hear this saying, if you've ever watched a military movie, we didn't fight for the cause. We fought for each other because of the sense of, of honor. What happens when those two th wired individuals come together and they, they don't understand that? Well, what happens in, in the short story is, is I'm going to speak to you through my filter. Egerich calls it the blue and the pink. I'm going to speak to you through my blue megaphone. But you're hearing me through pink headphones. I'm speaking to you through the man lens, and you're hearing it through the woman lens. Okay, imagine this conflict again. We just described how women tend to communicate face to face and how men communicate shoulder to shoulder. Look me in the eye. And, and now you're in a conflict, and the way she knows to solve this is, I want your eyes. I want your eyes. Look at me. Look at me. And you're like, you're, you want to fight me. You want to fight me. Yeah, and so I just got to walk away because you just want to look at me and tell me the truth and da-da-da-da. But if a, two guys did that, it would end in blows. You know, someone is going to come out of that a winner. They're not, they're, neither one of them are doing anything wrong. They're just speaking their language. And so you got to learn to, oh, this is what she's trying. Oh, she's trying to get my eye, not because she wants to shame me like my mom used to do. Look me in the eye. You did something wrong. Look me in the eye. She's doing that because she wants to connect with me. She wants to love me. And, and, and I, I want to look away from her, not because I don't love her, because I do love her. I love her so much, I refuse to do what I would do to a guy if we were in this same situation. And so I'm going to walk away, and she feels that as an abandonment, and we feel it as the nicest thing we can do it in that moment. And we've got to learn to bridge this gap. That's the brokenness that we're describing here. There used to be a oneness that existed. It's hard for us to even imagine. But there used to be a oneness that existed, and that broke at the fall. And so now we've got to deal with this brokenness and connect and communicate with one another. I can't, I just, if I could take the top of our heads off and pour into what he just said into our heads so we understand it. You just can't, I mean, honestly, in marriage uh, conflict, I'll have two people, and their marriage is going over the cliff. And I'll say to them, listen, you can't keep doing this to each other. You are treating her in an unloving way, and she's only going to take so much. And not only that, she is going to be, you know, here's the part I want you to track with. See, because we forgot, we didn't, you know, we didn't mention our enemy yet again, right? We have an enemy who baits us. There is an allure to be something that I'm not designed to be. See, and so unless you're able to step back. Now, what, what do I mean exactly? We can, the rest of that we can talk later, but now think about this, what I'm going to say. At the top of that triangle is God. Now, Egerich talks about this thing in the book, Love and Respect, about this thing he calls it the crazy cycle, that one thing leads to another. We spiral down. And once we start spinning or spiraling, it escalates. And so words are used, actions are used, you know, and so forth, and, and we end up now, it's like now we're keeping score and we're hurting one another. What stops that? And if it's not stopped, if it's not stopped, it, it'll end poorly. It'll end very poorly. So what stops it? Well, what stops it is 
this, this idea that, that I'm going to time out. Rather than, because right now what, what we're doing, my wife and I, we're just reacting to one another. You did this or didn't do this, and then I did this and didn't do this. I said this, you said this. And then, again, we're just keeping score. It's like, it's like you ever play tennis with someone that just slams the ball at you all the time? You know, that's all we're doing is just slamming the ball. And I'm so mad at you. I'm so, why did we ever get married? And then you start saying things like that. I don't know why I ever married you. Well, maybe we should get divorced. Now, see, and then, man, listen right there. Stop and listen. Where's the enemy? Where is the enemy right now? What does he do? The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So what happened in the movie? In the movie, Bob is being a man in, in a limited way, right? He's crashing car doors, and he's coming in, and he wants to be a superhero, and he cuts the meat, and he's fascinated that his son didn't get caught, it didn't even get on video. What is he doing? He's just, he's just being the dumb man, right? The, the one-sided, one-brain guy. But what happens in the other room? The woman who is life-giving and loving and nurturing and influence and beautiful and mercy and healing, what is happening? She sees the things that their love has produced going off the rails, the kids. So what does she do? She calls to her leader, protector, action, powerful, provider, justice-driven man and says, Bob, it's time to engage. Mm -hmm. So she, it's almost like if you can imagine, she lobs this thing across this gap, this male-female gap, and she invites him, Bob, please. You notice what he does, too, before he goes in and engages in power? The first thing he does is he abdicates leadership. He says, listen to your mom. That's how he, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to step in and say anything. I just want you. I want the, he's saying to her, I want you to lead. I want you. And she is. She's, she's not, not doing anything. She's connected here. And I, I know it's a cartoon, but it's a cartoon that hits very, very close to home. And then when she finally gets to that place, it's time to engage, Bob, and he kind of, but he doesn't, he's, he's not, he just reacts to that. You've called me out, so okay, here's my power, Oof. up with the table. He just shows his, his power. And man, I've been tempted into that, right? I just want to, I just want to use my power. I just want to show you, okay, I've been holding it back. I've been holding it back because I don't want this to be a fight, but here it is. And you could look at that clip and go, that's just so immature, mm -hmm. right? Let me, let me tell you a true story. So I had a couple that I'd been working with. This is years ago. They don't go to this church. Years ago. They were a younger couple, two small children. So they were in the season of marriage. It was tough. You know, they were both working full-time jobs. Kids were growing up. They were toddlers, so on. So, and they were always fighting with each other for all the reasons we're describing tonight. And I tried to help them, I tried to talk to them, I met with them together, met with them individually. The progress was slow. So one night I get a call, 11 o'clock at night, and it's him. He says, Bruce, I need to talk to you right away, you got a few minutes. I'm like, well, actually I was sleeping, but I'll go ahead. <laughs> it's, it's literally 11 o'clock. And he says, we just had a terrible fight. And in my brain I'm thinking, okay, can we talk about this tomorrow? No, 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 he said, uh, sh she just went down, she's in jail, they just put her in the, in the squad car in handcuffs, and I don't know what to do, I'm freaked out the kid. I'm like... Okay, all right, wait, what? What? And he tells me the story. Anyway, we, I, we circled back the next day, and I sat down with him. I said, so walk me through what happened. He goes, well, I'll tell you what happened. He said, uh, so uh, I got home from work, you know, and she got home from work, and she made dinner, and so we sat down to eat, and right after dinner, she said, let's get the kids off to bed. So she went up and got the kids off to bed, and, you know, I kind of went and sat down. There was a game on. It was Monday night, and I sat down in the recliner and turned on ESPN, and she was in the kitchen cleaning up, and she says, here comes the clip, right? From the kitchen, I hear these words. She said, it sure would be nice if someone helped me load the dishwasher. No sarcasm. Like, who are we talking about? Somebody. Like, are we talking about, is there somebody going to load this dishwasher for me? But what is she doing? She's firing the shot across the divide. What is she saying? She's saying, look, I really, I'm tired like you, and this would go a lot quicker, and we could both get to sleep if you would just help me load the dishwasher. Now, she didn't say it like that. She said it sure would be nice if somebody helped me load the dishwasher. I said, so what did you say? He said... Well, I shot back, well, all right, I'll help if you can't handle that one. Ooh. 
I said, then what happened? Oh, then what happened is she came flying out of that kitchen and she <laughs> ripped me a new one and, and she said this and this and this and then she started cussing and then I said, to, uh, I, 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 then what did you say? He said, well, here's what I said. I said, get out of my face because you're not my mother. It's like, whoa, how'd we get there? Well, if you weren't acting like a little boy, I wouldn't be tempted to talk to you like you're my little kid. Like I'm your mother, right? You see the perversion? You see how the spin happens now? You see, because in that moment, they were just going at each other. That man actually was, was passive. That man was not leading. That man was not laying his life down. That man, and so what did she do? She jumped in and said, well, I'm going to be all these things. This guy's not being. So I'll be tough. I'll be strong. I'll be aggressive. I'll be this. And it, it just, it never turns out. So I'll never forget, here's the end of it. I said to him, hey, listen, can I ask you a question? He goes, yeah, sure. I said, what would have happened if you would have, uh, in the moment you heard the words, it sure would be nice if someone helped me load the dishwasher. If you had just swallowed your pride and thought to yourself, my wife's tired, but in that moment you would have stopped and said, and prayed. I know who does that, right? <laughs> and, but you would have asked God, Lord Jesus, I think I heard my wife calling for help because she's tired and it would be a loving thing to go help her. Look. I was being sarcastic. But he said to me, oh, that's easy. I would have gotten up and helped her load the dishwasher. Why didn't you do it? Why didn't you do it? Well, because in the moment, I was just being selfish. I was being ignorant, whether willfully or, you know, on, on, on accident. But I was being selfish, right? Now that scene, that scenario plays out over and over and over again. You see, what I'm saying is we're baited. When we don't obey, when we don't respond to God before we react to our mate, we get baited to do things and be things that we're not wired and called to do and be. And then it just, it just circles down. It just circles down. It just spirals down. And somehow God wants us to catch it before then, right? We know our weaknesses, I think. We, we, know, we know our weaknesses, and this plays out, I, I can't, we don't have enough time to describe all the scenarios, but man, you, you think about sexuality in a marriage. You know, when the guy gets caught with his sex addiction or he gets caught with his weakness. Man, ladies, you have caught that guy. And he is caught, and he's wrong. But man, I'm telling you, you have no idea what holy ground that is. And, and I just say that simply because you're not a guy. I'm not making excuse for sexual sin. I'm not making excuse for addiction. I'm just saying, that's the world we live in. So what will I do? Will I operate according to Ephesians 5? Will I operate according to what my friends down at the Silver Spur tell me to operate on? Just dump him. Just dump her. Just get in debt. And it's just, there's something better. There's a better way. This is why Paul calls this a mystery. Because when done... Like Bruce just described, instead of in reaction to someone who is right now pulling the worst out of me, if instead I respond to God and communicate with God and deal with myself, mm -hmm. rather than I'd rather deal with what I see in you, whether it be male, female, it doesn't matter, whatever, whatever I see in you that's driving me nuts, if instead I'll, I'll deal with God first, it just completely, it, it cuts off the power of the enemy there to, to manipulate that, that brokenness that we have with one another. And it restores the oneness, but first with God, so that we can restore the oneness with our, our spouse. And this isn't, this isn't like something that, again, you get a degree in. This is a, we're describing discipleship here. We're describing our walk with the Lord. We're describing maturity. We're describing figuring out what our wounds are. That's what I meant when I said that, 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 that thing you, you found, you know, you're discovering a man's wound. It's not an excuse, but it's a reason, right? And we all have wounds. We have all, we all. And if we're speaking through our wound, something hasn't come to the cross. So we, this, is, this is like this call, this, we're throwing it out there as this call. Listen, you guys, listen, Jesus knows us front and back, inside and out. But um, we have to understand how much the siren song has pulled me away and said, well, you know, I'm just, am I reacting in a biblical fashion here? Am I just, am I acting redemptively? Am I acting in line with my gifting or am I just firing away because I've been hurt and, and emotions are flying and so on and so forth? Hmm. 
Let's uh, look at Hebrews 12, then we'll, I think we'll move to the panel after that. But Hebrews 12 says this. If the siren song of our culture, because there's a, there's a siren song of the culture that says, serve yourself. Serve yourself. That is the ultimate, like just comfort. And it first lulls us into this just lethargy, this weakness that then ends in death. Then what is the call from heaven? And the author of Hebrews says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Then you see the difference between someone you know, tied to the, the, the mast of a ship whose eyes are fixed on the temptation and one who is fixed on Jesus? the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We're going to move to our panel, and uh, some of our panel is right here in front. Come on up, you guys. And, uh... and we get Bruce and Linda yeah. on the panel today. Yeah. So let's just start down here and introduce yourselves, how long you've been married, uh, yeah, just quickly, a little bit of your background, then we'll, we'll come this direction. Yeah, so my name is Lydia, and this is my husband, Jordan, and we have been married for two years. Yeah. Two years, all right. Newlyweds. I'm Courtney, and this is Josh. We've been married for almost nine years. We have two little girls and a little boy that we're fostering. Oh, nice. Okay, how old are the kids? Uh, five, three, and one. Okay, Dad, could you have rattled off those ages if I asked you? Okay, <laughs> just checking. All right, Linda. Okay, so our story is we've been married 44 years. Um, this past December, we sub celebrated 44 years, and we have two grown sons who are married with two delightful, wonderful uh, daughter-in-laws, and uh, mm -hmm. we have an eight-year-old grandson, almost nine, and so, um, yeah, it's been a, a great season recently. Awesome. All right, well, let's go back down to this end, and we want to come this way with our more troubled couples, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll start, start off easy. Uh, we described up here just a few minutes ago that siren song of the siren song of selfishness, the siren song of comfort. Like, what, what does that look like? You're two years married. What does it look like? How, how has marriage challenged that comfort? And, and you know, how, what, what does the battle look like towards caring for someone else over, over self? Jordan, be brave. Come on. Yeah, it's interesting. So we got married a little later. So I'm 36. She's 35. And honestly, uh, on the paper when it said, you know, what's your temptation? For me, it was definitely selfishness because... Um, I lived on my own for quite a while, you know, cooked for myself, all that stuff that a normal adult is supposed to do, an adult male. So actually when we got married, um, that was tough. Like I was very excited to share that with her, but I had my own way of doing stuff, you know, and uh, I didn't realize it would be that, that tough actually. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah, who knew? Marriage might be challenging. <laughs> what a surprise. How about you? You want to? Yeah, go ahead. Who, me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, comfort, sorry, what was the question again? Yeah, what is the, <laughs> that siren song of like, what, what's the temptation? What do you, what do you want to move towards that, that, that marriage challenges you away from? Um, I mean, Courtney and I are really different, very different. Um, the more we're married, the more I think we realize that. For me, I'm very much of a type A go-getter, um, jump before I look. Mm. I commit to a lot of things. Um, always have something going. Mm -hmm. So I think for us, you know, for me, being married is like I am forced to slow down and uh, really think about what I'm doing with my time and not be so driven, not be so goal-oriented and focused on attaining that thing or that project or that job or that goal. So, Courtney, it sounded like he just said he, he might charge forward, and, it, and you found some, um, some ways of dealing with that. But what was that like early in marriage when he made a decision and maybe didn't talk to you about it or think it all the way through the way you would have, if, if indeed you're different than that? Um, 
I mean, we had a really rough first couple years of marriage because of he was in leadership with YWAM or with Youth, Youth with a Mission. Um, so there were, he was used to kind of taking charge and like being the leader and making decisions when he had to. So that kind of poured into our marriage. Um, and it, it was hard for me feeling like I didn't, you know, have a say or, um, that he wasn't like asking me and we were making the, the decision together. So, um, yeah, it just, it was, it was hard. Okay. Bruce and Linda? Oh, sorry, yeah, Lydia. Would you want to, could you answer that same question we've, we've asked her? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think Jordan and I are very similar in our answer where I was a very selfish person at the beginning of our marriage. And I mean, we're only two years married, so we're still kind of sifting through some of those challenges. Um, but really, the last couple months, it's been some, something super simple that's really helped me. And it's just hiding God's word in my heart so that when there is conflict or I want to give in to my flesh, yeah. the Holy Spirit can really speak through me and just really fight for me and just remind me, like, biblically how to respond in those types of situations. So that, uh, it's, it's interesting. So the practice, then, that you've found that combats that is you've got... When you say hi to God's word in your heart, what do you mean? Just what does the Bible say or what you like memorizing scripture so that it's hidden in my heart. So, you know, when I'm triggered by something, mm -hmm. it's like, that's what the Bible says. That's awesome. And it's been really cool to just kind of see that renewing of your mind. All right. So Bruce and Linda, you're pastors, so obviously you've only done it right. <laughs> yeah. You met and, and figured that all out so early. No, what, what, did, what, did, what did you guys look like when, when you first met? What, what did the, the oh temptation goodness. look like? <laughs> well, we were not at all um, Christians when we first met. We were far from that. And uh, we were doing the crazy um, hippie life thing. And if you've seen the Jesus Revolution yet movie, that was us. And, uh, but then we had this amazing encounter with God, and he pursued us, and he brought us um, to salvation together, which was absolutely wonderful. But it was a short time between that and when we got married. So we had lived together about a year and a half prior to, to finding the Lord and, and uh, really giving him our lives. And then anyway... So it was just like three months after that that we got married. And so everything was so new, um, this whole relationship with God and, and trying to figure out what marriage was all about. And uh, really, I was pretty clueless as far as like that, that graph that we had up on the screen into my role. And so, yeah, I was super selfish and went in my way. And, you know, um, I just want to, yeah. I just want you to be everything I think you should be, and and uh, that that didn't work. I mean, these unrealistic expectations, and um, it just it took a long time to really undo, uh, you know, my old behavior, my whole nature, and then let God renew me and really teach me. And we had some other great people in our lives too, as well that that really poured into our lives. So. That's, that's kind of how the beginning first years were, and they were pretty bumpy. Yeah, pretty bumpy. The, it was like a lot of fire and smoke, I mean, because we had gotten together purely on the physical attraction piece. I wasn't really looking to get married, and just again, like those, that, that era, it was like, no one cared about commitment. It was just like, hey, you want to hang out with me? You want to sleep with me? And, and so there was this total heathen approach. Now, both of us had some religious Catholic sort of ish background but none of it had gotten past our heads into our hearts the idea of transformation but I remember the, one of the things that we clashed with right away when things were great it was great when things were awful it was awful <laughs> and it was like we were on this roller coaster you know what I mean Does anybody, I don't know if that makes sense but as long as everything was going great we were great but man the slightest little thing would just tip us over emotionally and it was really asking the questions at 23 years of age, 
What has shaped you and I up to this point? Now, again, at that time, I had no idea. What? What are you talking about? But we had, fortunately, like some really good people around us that began to help us unpack that question. Do you even know why you are the way you are? Do you know how this came into your life? And, and by poking around a little bit in the past, it kind of empowered and changed our present. So. Follow up real quick, then we'll go back down here. But... Uh, what did, so you get saved, but salvation doesn't just take care of all that? Yeah. I mean, what, honestly, like, because you, you come together, you're just, like you say, you're just like, well, this is attractive, this is fun, this is good. And then you get saved and you get married, but you still have to deal with that because you're born again, right? So why is there anything left over? What? That's a great question. And I think we got saved off of a it was just a radical kind of a conversion story. It was crazier than crazy, but it was real. It was real because we knew what we were like, and God just instantly began a work in us of transformation. But it was, some things were fast, and some things were slow. And maturity and godliness was slow. Some deliverance things, because of what we were involved in, was very quick. And that was evidence, like, this is real. But some stuff was just just slower than slow because it was line upon line and precept. So salvation, that's why I liken it oftentimes to there's a wedding, which is real. It's very fast and happens in a day and very expensive. But then there's marriage, which is very slow and happens over a period of time. We live in the marriage. And I think that's what we discovered. Like, oh, there's way more. There's no quick fix because what we oftentimes want is a quick. And that's what, when we would fight or argue, that's what we wanted. We wanted a quick fix. And we oftentimes would find that quick fix, but it never really fixed the underlying issues because they kept popping up. Mm, that's good. All right, so any of the couples, but maybe the two couples down here. Uh, would you be brave and describe a time? We talked about the difference between reacting to one another and what we're seeing on the other side versus responding to God. Could you describe a time or times in your marriage where you know, oh, I'm, I've, this is the time we reacted to each other rather than actually respond to God? Yeah, actually for us, um, it's been pretty fresh. A couple of months ago, we had a, a doozy. Um, I had a job that I loved that was, uh, you know, something I was really enjoying and kind of checked every box for me and financially had us in a spot where she didn't even have to work. But there was something about the job that she just didn't feel right about. And, um, you know, we've, we've gone back to the beginning and we realized that we weren't on the same page when I took the position. And uh, every time she would bring it up how she felt, I kind of wanted to approach it like fixing my truck. Like, well, is there spark? Is there fuel? Okay. Like, I was kind of not paying attention to her, her needs. And uh, just kind of trying to blare through, because as a, as a man, I wanted to be the provider, which I think is a good thing. Um, it's the way I was raised and kind of was on my heart. I said, hey, this is a very good thing for us, you know. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, it, you know, she, she had a reservation. So um, long story short, you know, it, it got us in a lot of spin cycles, because in my mind, I was trying to do the right thing that I knew was right, and then she had her side. Um, and it wasn't until we really figured out um, that we just needed to really submit to the Lord and go, okay, you know, we're in this together. And I'm going to use some Portland math here. One plus one equals three. <laughs> it's something that we've learned recently through some counseling. And the, the whole idea is that, you know, she's one, I'm one. We both bring our own stuff to the table. But there's that third element, which a Christ-centered relationship. Mm. Um, and as a husband, I have to create a safe space for her to want to enter into. Um, and she has to do the same thing for me. Especially, I noticed uh, getting married later, it's, it was a lot easier for us to just want to throw up the hands and go, well, you know, I was fine before you. I can do this. I'm an adult. And, you know, we would butt heads. We're both firstborn. So, but um, kind of just, again, submitting to the Lord and going, okay, you know, she, she's responsible for her stuff. I'm responsible for my stuff. And I have to be aligned with, with the Lord on a daily basis and mm -hmm. kind of bring that. That's, that's kind of what's helped us. So. Would you describe that from your point of view? What was that like? So you're, you're waving a flag saying there's something wrong, there's something wrong. But he just kind of wants to fix it. What, what, what was that like from your side? Yeah, I think 
earlier when you were talking about your wife being like, I feel that this is a wrong thing, even though I don't logistically or logically think that I have the points to bring up to make it be like, oh, that makes sense to me. I just was waving my flag and just being like, I don't feel right about this. I really felt like maybe the Holy Spirit was convicting me about, you know, the situation or something. It just didn't seem right. And, you know, I'm wearing pink glasses and he's wearing blue glasses and we just weren't able to really communicate to a place where we could be on the same page about it. And man, it was just a lot of like counseling, bringing it to the Lord constantly every day, just being in the word. Um, And we did learn something really great in counseling when we went. It was called a work talk. So just, um, it's seven steps that, I don't know, we don't have to get into it, but if you Google focus on the family work talk, (laughs) it's just really being able to have a discussion together as a couple and being able to make really important decisions together so both people are happy and comfortable with the decision. Yeah. So That's great. Courtney, did you have something? What, what did that look like, the times that you have reacted to one another rather than respond to God? Um, yeah, so Josh has a lot of, like, ideas, um, random invention ideas or job ideas, a lot of different things, and he will nice. very excitingly come to me and say, I just thought of a new idea. And it's cool, but I very quickly see like all the negative of it. Mm -hmm. So I will very quickly shoot them down. Yeah. Every relationship needs a dreamer and a dream killer. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Hey, we don't live in cotton candy world where this just all works out, right? Yep. I'm on your side. Yeah. I'm a killer. And it's, yeah. <laughs> I see the excitement and I think it's cool. Yeah. And in my head, I'm thinking, yeah, that would be awesome. But I only vocalize the, the negatives and I very just, I just shoot them down and respond very quickly. And of course it just, just destroys him. And he's, you know, if obviously he doesn't want to share it with me again, but he does, um, and so I feel like instead of me reacting that way, I could be like stopping myself and just kind of giving it to the Lord and saying like, what's, what, you know, I can, I can encourage him and I can support him in this. Doesn't mean it's going to happen, but instead of shooting them down, just maybe let him give a spiel. <laughs> I like you. We should talk. <laughs> My kids think I'm a dream killer, too. <laughs> They're like, just let me dream. Like, no. <laughs> what, what, from your point of view, what does that look like? Or... <laughs> sorry, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, no, I mean, yeah, it's, I do have a lot of ideas. I'm a kind of a visionary. I get excited about a lot of things. I'm a passionate person. I'm also an external processor. So I need to externally process this new amazing idea that's going to change the world. Uh (laughs) But when I do that, we were actually talking about this last night, is that it's like me bringing this like little baby bird (laughs) that I just found. And I'm so excited about (laughs) finding this little baby bird. I'm like, look at this cool little baby bird. Don't you want to like raise it? Like we can make a little house for it and Courtney just like slaps it on my hand smashes it yeah. he's like that's a horrible idea are you kidding me you can't take care of this baby bird where I'm just like and then I'm in tears crying but my invention ideas my job ideas or business ideas or whatever yeah. is this baby bird that I'm bringing to her and all I'm not I'm not looking to do this I just I'm just processing or something you know and I just want you to acknowledge the bird and <laughs> Say it is a cute baby bird. And then if we're actually going to take this to like R&D, like research and development, we're going to do something about it or like Uh sink some like money into it, then I want to hear everything you have to say. Because I'm not, you know, an idealist either. So it's like, I want to make the best thing happen. So I want to hear all the negative things that you have to say about my idea, but just relish in the the baby bird for a minute. Mm -hmm. Outward processors, man. 
Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Linda. What, what is so I think um, a temptation that, that I have to fight off and I sometimes struggle with in that chart, it talked about the, the lady being the tender, you know, the woman's side is tender and many times I'll just be tough or I'll harden my heart or, or I'll just not be um, that soft, uh, loving, um, gentle person and um, I will just kind of, when they talked about last week the conflict styles, just kind of shut down that Eskimo kind of mode and, and just withdraw and, and not want to face it or, uh, and I know that can be super hurtful and painful, you know, to Bruce because um, he really wants to talk it out more and I'm kind of more like, well, I don't know if I want to talk this out or not and, and um, close down and things like that. So that's a real, that's a real struggle for me, but um, getting better at it, <laughs> um, thankfully. But uh, yeah, and I know that's a lot to do with just kind of crazy upbringing and those woundedness and things like that. But but God's grace is really, um, I'm not who I used to be, but I'm not totally where I want to be yet either in his image and who he's made me to be. So, Could you describe that when you say crazy upbringing? You don't have to like share your whole story, but what do you mean? Like he's, he's not your, your family of origin. He's someone different. So why do, you, why do we do that? Why do we respond out of a mom and dad place instead of a husband and wife place? Yeah. Or what does that look like for you? Well, I, I didn't have really very healthy um, models or role models or examples as a child growing up. Um, it was just a lot of um, chaos and a lot of instability. And um, my, yeah, my mom was a drinker. My dad died when I was really young. And so that turned her toward, you know, drinking to kind of cope and manage with life as a single mom. And anyway, um, she just got into really unhealthy relationships. And so that's kind of what I saw. And I saw that toughness in my mom as well. And uh, unfortunately, you know, it just kind of... Um, became a part of who I was, um, but God has really um, done a great work in my life, and through the years, I can say that he's really uh, been there to teach me and, and grow me up and, uh, yeah, help me become more of uh, a loving, tender mm. person. Bruce, you, you, how long did it take? You, you came, your, your mom and dad stayed together, and... So did you just expect her to respond the way that you'd seen? Or what did it, what did it take to learn the, the, the background of one another to be able to speak each other's language? Yeah, it's a great. I, I grew up in Chicago, big city, went to a big high school. But I, looking back, you know, years later, I realized I still lived a fair, even though I was surrounded by, you know, 5 million people, high school of 4,000 kids, I never heard the gospel in high school. Never had anybody share the gospel with me. So I had no idea what the gospel was. Literally no idea. And then, but my family was pretty stable. My dad was a World War II vet. My mom was a nurse. We ate dinner at 5.20 every evening. You had to be to dinner. My dad was a quiet guy, but he was the leader of the house. He was a disciplinarian. And, you know, he was military. So it's like, buck up, son, you know. And that's, how, that's kind of what we grew up with. I had three other siblings. And, but like Josh, I was very much an external processor. I was kind of the creative weird force and in in I was the, out, the black sheep of the family. I, I would do different things and, and, and my parents thought I was crazy. But um, when I met her, I just thought everybody was raised in that kind of environment. So we would get into like some kind of an argument or fight and I would want to process it. I'd want to just talk about it. I'd want to let's engage, let's mix this up. And her response at even the slightest raise of my voice would be, she'd shut down. Well, then that would, I'd, then I'll turn the volume up. Like, okay, well, I mean, obviously you're not listening, and I would turn, and then that would just, it would, and again, the crazy cycle would start. It would start to escalate. And it wasn't until, I think it was three or four years into our marriage, and we had that cycle that was crazy. And uh, here's what happened, though. It was really interesting. I was so mad that she just couldn't get it together, and I thought it was simple. And I, and I just said one time, you know what's wrong with us? You don't love yourself. And, but I'll never forget that moment because she stopped and looked at me and said, you're right. I don't. And I'm going to find out why. And she began a journey with Jesus 
back into her past to find out where did that what what where did that start? Where did that wound come from? And it transformed her life. It literally transformed who she was. That journey with Jesus. Hmm. That's amazing. Uh, I don't know how much more time we should take. But I, I kind of want to ask the, just the question about love and respect before we go, go away here. Uh, we talk about honor and respect and how men tend to speak that language and how women speak the language of love. Has that something, have, have you discovered that to be true? Is, is, is this new information to you guys or is this something, I'm sorry, we haven't really prepped you with this question, but have you found that to be true? Are, are you learning to speak one another's language and, and what does that look like? I don't, I don't care who answers, but what is it, how do you speak your spouse's language if that needs to be honor and respect towards a man or love towards a woman. Have, have you figured out how to do that? Oh, <clears throat> we both went through the, Courtney, I went through love and respect when we, yeah. uh, how long were we married for? Like a year? Yeah, so it was it was an awesome series. We loved it. It was really, a, you know, good to have that early on. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for us, it's just, you know, the language I grew up in my family of origin is like, like I was loud too. Like I'm allowed, you know, I get, I love fighting, arguing, mm -hmm. like let's take this to the mat and let's do this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I think for me, obviously, you know, and Courtney's a lot quieter and has to think about things and is a little bit, you know, deeper and I'm just ready, like let's go. Um, for me, it wasn't loving when we, when I would do that and I would push her for the first two years of our marriage, you know, it was like, if she didn't have a response to something or a, to some conflict that we were in, to me it was like, well, then you don't care about it, so I'm just going to make a decision. Um, and that was really tough. And then for, I think, well, I don't want to talk for you, but then for you, for on the other end, it was like, I don't respect you in the sense because you're just making decisions for everything. Like, I don't even have a say in what we're doing. You know, it's like, I think it was devaluing, you know. Um, so that was, it was a very hard first two years of marriage for us mm -hmm. and figuring out like how to speak each other's language, how to have conflict. The conflict week was, was really good and reinforcing for us. Um, but yeah, just even last night we were fighting about stuff, just <laughs> <laughs> fighting about what we're talking about right now. Uh, mm. it was like, what was the bird's <laughs> name? I want to know. What, what, no, what bird that. did she it kill? Was, it was just like, you're saying words. I'm hearing something, but like my, you're not hearing, like, like my brain is like decoding this in a way that you don't understand, you know? And I spew out information and your brain takes it in and decodes it. And we're just, you know, like we're on two totally different pages. So for us, it's just like, okay, calm down, take a breather. Mm -hmm. I believe the best in you. You believe the best in me. Like, oh, we're going to get, you know, we're going to get through this. And it wasn't even a big deal. Like, you know, we didn't want to turn something that was small into something big. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been a huge help for both of us is, like, remembering that we're both, we're both on the same team yeah. and that we believe the best in each other. We see the best in each other. Uh, we know that our goals are the same. It's for the good of our family, for the good of us. Um, and, you know, for what God wants to do through us. So we both know that that's, you know, that's where we're headed. That's our goal. That's our desire. We're just going to come at it from two different ways. Yeah. Courtney, did you get that right? Anything you want to add? Okay. How about you guys? The, that language of love and respect, are you learning to speak each other's language? Yeah. I think I'm learning how Jordan likes, wants to feel respected. Um, so as a wife, just really, you know, kind of trying to analyze that or just ask the, even the Lord, hey, how can I love Jordan and show that I really respect him? Because of course I didn't want, you know, to not have a disagreement about his job. I want, you know, I want him to do what he wants to do and be happy. And um, so I think we're still kind of figuring that out. But um, just really, even if it's like a night, he's, if, even if I'm right, maybe like 98% of the time, <laughs> Not on all, not on all things, but <laughs> I feel like there's always a, there's always something that I can ask the Lord, Hey, what, what do you want to show me? Or how do you want to change my heart in this? You know, there's, you can be right 99% of the time, but there's always 1% even yeah. that I feel like the Lord is trying to show you and work in you and change your heart mm -hmm. instead of just kind of 
viewing like, well, this is what my husband's doing and these are all the wrong things. It's okay. Let's, how can God change my heart? And I think that's been really um, pivotal in the way that I can just love Jordan, really show him that I respect him and want him to lead our family. So. Yeah, I guess really quick for me, it's it's simple, it's still tough, but just that's the importance of timing. So for instance, I come home from work, I'm tired, I don't want to talk, but in that like small 15 second, look at her, give her a hug, um, it's it's amazing how that pays big div- dividends, just the timing of stuff, um, and really figuring out that if I really want respect, um, I just need I need to love her more and be tender, and that's sometimes is tough. But it's amazing to to see that that just the simple interaction, you know, and, and really uh, doing a a self check of going, you know, what what really fuels her, and tapping into that, and it just it it takes some some thinking, but you got to do it. So, I just want to say, you know, in the early days of our marriage, when we would fight, the siren song, for for me, I'll speak for myself, was this. You married the wrong person. That's what the lie sounded like to me. You married the wrong, there's somebody out there that you should have married or that you'd be happier with. And, and, it, and, and it, it would spin me out. But it was a lie. I, I look back now and realize, dear Lord. But I, 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 I kind of, in my weird brain, I would entertain it briefly. And it would, and it would cause more issues, right? It, it, would, it would breed insecurity in her. So we had to come up with this thing of, like, like Josh said, hey, mm-hmm. we're not, this is, we're going we're gonna to work this through. It's ugly right now, but this is going to get better. So mm, That's good. Yeah. Because we did come to be on that same page with our values and, you know, our relationship with God and believing the call upon our lives together. And that has really held us in that, in that strong place, in that secure place. And and uh, we've really learned how to uh, bless one another, to serve one another. Um, I mean, we're in that transcendent passages of love, you know, that we did a couple weeks ago. And it's really been a beautiful place to be yeah. because we've, you know, put a lot of that stuff from our past in the past. And now we can enjoy the fruit of God's good work through us and in us. And, uh, yeah, it's worth it. It's so worth it. To work for your marriage, it's so worth it. Hmm. That's great. My, just yesterday, my, my wife, we were laughing because they, they sent us an AARP card. I guess <laughs> when you turn 50, they start to just send you those and offer you a cooler. I'm like, <sighs> this is where our life is. And my wife said, you know, there's a lot about getting older I am not enjoying, but there is a closeness to God and to you that just wasn't there 10, 20 years ago that is there now. So, yeah, stay on the road, guys. Um, all right, well, let's, let's go to tables. Thank, can we thank our, our team here? These guys were money. Yeah. Yeah, if, if nothing else, I've got that picture for the rest of my life of a little baby bird in the hand.